I would also like to say what an immense pleasure it has been to work with those of you who um, are attending my seminar here on listening and power. Uh, we have had two intense days of uh, readings, discussions, very lively discussions, and at the same time very focused discussions uh, around a collection of textual and filmic materials ranging from Barthes to Hitchcock, from Kafka to Foucault, from Nietzsche to Francis Ford Coppola. Um, so as Chris mentioned, I changed the title and topic of my talk. I had thought of presenting something around my current work on the economy of images, uh, what I call their iconomy. But then I decided to share with you some thoughts and hypotheses that are closer to the work we are doing here in the seminar, um, i.e. some reflections on punctuation and power. Uh, I will try to sketch out, it's a little ambitious, uh, what a general theory of punctuation would look like, and hence my title that Chris mentioned, of stigmatology towards a general theory of punctuation. I have some slides with uh, quotes, images, and uh, various uh, punctuating marks. <clears throat> uh, stigmatology, this is the Oxford English Dictionary. Stigmatology is an old word, obsolete and rare, says the Oxford English Dictionary, in an entry marked, as you can see on the upper right side, as not yet fully updated. So this is an incentive to uh, start working on it. Uh, stigmatology is a work, uh, sorry, a word that one stumbles upon only in the dusty pages of ancient volumes, more or less forgotten today like these memoirs by a Scottish reverend, reverend named Thomas Boston, published in 1776, from which I quote the following passage that you have uh, under your eyes. I am of their opinion who think the Hebrew text is most accurately pointed, and from my own observation, as well as from books, I am convinced the sacred stigmatology bears the signature of a divine hand. The difficulty has been and is to assign the proper value to the several stops therein used." End of quote. Stigmatology, then, would be the art of punctuating. But you might be wondering, why exhume, why unearth this obsolete word from the pages where it is buried. In stigmatology, we hear, on the one hand, the ancient Greek names designating the punctuating mark of the grammarians, the equivalents of the Latin punctum, that are stigma or stigme, derived from the verb stizain. We must listen to all the senses of this verb, which means to sting, to tattoo, to mark with an imprint, and even to cause contusions or to cover with bruises. Thus, uh, Xantias, in line uh, 1296 of Aristophanes' Wasps, Xantias complains of being covered in bruises, stizomenos, after having been beaten with a club. Naming this uh, violence here at the threshold of my talk, summoning this violence at the outset of my talk, is a way of saying from the beginning the horizon toward which I will tend, toward the exertion of force that is always inherent in every punctuating gesture. For punctuation is never merely a matter of style or rhetoric in the common sense, it is the exercise of power. Stigmatology, our dusty old word, or what I could call a paleonym, uh, is thus meant on the one hand to 
awaken and sharpen our ears to what will we, we will ultimately describe as the political, or maybe more precisely, the archi-political dimension of punctuation. But, on the other hand, stigmatology will be the name of an attempt to generalize the concept of punctuation beyond its supposed limits. Under the title of stigmatology, we will thus, of course, study the repertoire of punctuation marks in all their combinations, including what we could call their pure or absolute usages, that is to say, isolated, without either words or phrases that carry them, as when Victor Hugo is said to have asked his editor about the sales of, the, of Les Miserables by telegraphing him a question mark, only to receive an exclamation mark by way of a response. Um, very quickly, we will realize that this first region, uh, supposedly the region of punctuation in the so-called strict sense of the term, this first region is impossible to circumscribe rigorously. Um, besides the punctuation of sentences, there is what certain literary theorists, like Isabelle Sersa, in a recent book entitled Esthétique de la Ponctuation, what she calls the punctuation, punctuation de page, punctuation of the page, by uh, blanks, paragraphs, and uh, indentation. Uh, or there is also the punctuation d'oeuvre, as she calls it, i.e. punctuation of the work, by dividing it into sections or volumes. In the end, the concept of punctuation seems to overflow itself in all directions, since it includes the spaces between words, or even in E. E. Cummings' poems, the space between syllables and letters, as well as the chapter breaks and the luxuriant outgrowth of rubricated letters or illuminations. That is why it will be also difficult to decide where punctuation, properly speaking, ends and where its metaphoric use begins. The great 18th century British landscape architect, Lancelot Capability Brown, spoke of the art of gardens in terms of periods and commas. Sometimes you will have quotations that I won't read aloud, but you can just get a glimpse. Uh, and uh, Walter Murch, uh, we have been talking, we will be talking about him in the seminar. Walter Murch, who is best known as Francis Ford Coppola's editor for films such as Apocalypse Now and The Conversation. Uh, Walter Murch describes the exercise of gazing as a rhythmic articulation or phrasing by the blinking of the eye. I quote him. We blink to separate and punctuate, he notes, before concluding that we must render visual reality discontinuous, otherwise perceived reality would resemble an almost incomprehensible string of letters without word separation or punctuation, end of quote. So from the page to the landscape, from the sentence to the batting of an eyelid, the paleonym stigmatology is meant to designate precisely this oscillation, this indefinition that affects the concept of punctuation and that allows its seemingly limitless extension into such diverse domains. Stigmatology will thus be concerned with all kinds of punctuating effects. Stigmatology will describe the physiognomy of the different types of marks, like Adorno, who compared the exclamation mark to an index finger raised in warning, the question mark to a blink of an eye, or the semicolon to a drooping moustache. Stigmatology will also be interested in all the reappropriations and reinventions of punctuation, 
in the practice of emoticons, in which typographic signs are constantly recombined in a changing repertory, the now classic smiley and frowny, opposing happiness and unhappiness in a binary way, have proliferated into a range of affects that go from the state of shock to hysterical laughter, passing by way of tears or cruelty, and giving rise to countless variants like the Japanese wink or the indication of deference by kneeling. So you have to imagine yourself on all fours, your round head followed by your arms and your folded legs. Uh, when taken to the point of composing a businessman wearing a tie or a vampire's pointy incisors, <laughs> punctuation becomes pictography. As in Tristram Shandy, the Lawrence Stern novel that will occupy us later, it becomes drawing, it crystallizes, it erects and monumentalizes itself into an image. So in this expansion of the concept of punctuation, in the blurring of the line that separates its supposedly proper domain and its analogical overflows, music plays a very special part. According to a, a hypothesis forcefully defended by musicologist Leo Treitler, Neumes, uh, the first form of Western musical notation, neumes could have emerged from punctuation marks. You have a long quote, so I won't get into the details. And uh, later, many a treatise on melody in the 19th century has drawn on the analogy between melodic movement and the articulation of periods. In his Traité de Mélodie, published in Paris in 1814, Antoine Reicha writes that, I quote, cadences in music are largely analogous to grammatical punctuation, for example, to the comma, the colon, the semicolon, and the period, end of quote. Um, it is music theorist Hugo Riemann, though, whom Nietzsche credits in the case of Wagner as being, I quote, the first to establish the validity of the central concept of punctuation for music, adding in a parenthesis that, I quote again, unfortunately, he, Riemann, used an ugly term, phrasierung. Indeed, in the short treatise on phrasing that Riemann co-authored with Nietzsche's friend, composer and pianist Karl Fuchs, the notion of punctuation plays a central role. Under the heading Interpunktion durch Ordnungszahlen der Takte innerhalb der Periode, uh, more or less punctuation by means of ordinal numbering of bars inside the period, their Catechism of Phrasing, that's the title of their book, Catechismus der Phrasierung, published in Leipzig in 1890, uh, their book dedicates a whole section of the appendix to the art of dividing an eight-bar melodic phrase as if it were articulated by punctuation marks. I quote, one could think of comma, semicolon, colon, and full stop as equivalents for the structural value of the second, fourth, sixth, and eighth bars in the period, the colon having here the rather unusual sense of indicating a punchline, a tagline, the crucial point of a sentence. And you can see the uh, example with the numbers. So here too, uh, in music, as in gardening or in film, the concept of punctuation seems to expand analogically beyond its supposed limits. Punctuation marks have equivalence, equivalente, in the division of melodies. But the idea of a musical punctuation seems bound to push the analogy so far that it becomes unrecognizable as an analogy. <laughs> 
Indeed, when Adorno writes that, I quote, there is no element in which language resembles music more than in the punctuation marks, the relation of priority between the two terms of the resemblance becomes undecidable. It is not anymore a simple question of music mimicking periods or commas, but, <clears throat> to quote Adorno again, it is also the comma and the period that corresponds to the half cadence and the authentic cadence, and it is exclamation points that are like silent symbol clashes, question marks that are like musical upbeats, end of quote. So if the analogy functions both ways, uh, language and music, or music and language, uh, then it means that the analogy tends to lose its contours as a mere analogy. And it is in music that this uh, happens. Music, then, could be the domain par excellence where the overflowing of the concept of punctuation appears as such, where it exhibits its inherent tendency to expand, a tendency that uh, the paleonym stigmatology seeks to capture. But music is also the domain where the political or archipolitical dimension or micropolitical dimension maybe of punctuation becomes audible, where we can begin to hear the exercise of power that the verb stidzain uh, expresses, the violent exercise of force and, and power. It is not by chance that Nietzsche's elliptic allusion to Riemann and punctuation in the case of Wagner occurs in the context of a paragraph, paragraph 11, where he deplores that in declining cultures, the decision comes to rest with the masses. In order to better understand what Nietzsche is getting at here, we can recall his words in a letter to Karl Fuchs, where he takes up and makes explicit the somewhat cursory argument of the case of Wagner, i.e. that punctuation brings the life of, of great forms down to the unbounded luxuriance of what is smallest. So punctuation is a sort of decomposition of, of great uh, forms. Here then are the lines that uh, Nietzsche addresses to his friend, Karl Fuchs, on August 26, 1888. Uh, as you can see, these are long, sinuous sentences that I will try to translate as literally as possible, uh, trying to maintain uh, their meanderings and their very singular punctuation, because these sentences almost seem to mimic voluntarily or involuntarily the very disintegration that they deplore. So let me read that aloud as, as well as I can. It's not easy <laughs> if you respect this very strange punctuation. So take a deep breath. <laughs> This animation and enlivening of the smallest parts of discourse of music, I wish that you and Riemann would use the words known to everyone from rhetoric, period, sentence, colon, comma, according to the size, likewise interrogatory sentence, conditional sentence, imperative, for the theory of phrasing is definitely the same as the theory of punctuation in prose and poetry. Anyway, we <clears throat> considered this animation and enlivening of the smallest parts as it belongs in music to Wagner's praxis and has spread from there to become almost a dominant system of interpretation, even for actors and singers, with related phenomena in other arts. It is a typical symptom of decay, a proof that life has withdrawn from the whole and is luxuriating in the infinitesimal. End of quote, luckily. <laughs> um, so, while uh, recognizing its importance, Nietzsche thus places the notion of musical punctuation under the sign of this Wagnerism, which for him partakes in a decline, an inexorable erosion of forms. <clears throat> 
punctuating amounts to making or letting the infinitesimal proliferate until it sucks the life out of the whole. And Wagner becomes the name or the metonymy for punctuation as disintegration and decay. For Wagner is above all synonymous with endless melody as one of the fragments in the second volume of Human, All to Human describes it, a profusion of effects that in order to avoid at all costs the petrification or crystallization of music, that is, its taking form, ends up sounding like what Nietzsche calls rhythmic paradoxes and blasphemies, rhythmische Paradoxien und Lästerreden, bearing witness in the end to an overripeness of the feeling for rhythm, their überreife der rhythmischen Gefühls. So the hyperpunctuation of Wagnerian phrasing is the becoming overripe, uh, almost the, the rotting of uh, the rhythmic sense for Nietzsche. But curiously enough, a few pages earlier, in a previous fragment of Human All to Human, uh, this same infinite melody was nonetheless the emblem of um, uh, Lawrence Stern's, or Lorenz Stern, as Nietzsche calls him, uh, supreme freedom of spirit in literature. Um, what the endless melody exalts this time in the author of Tristram Shandy is in fact an artistic style in which fixed form, the bestimmte form, is constantly being broken up as well as displaced. Verschoben, Nietzsche writes, which is also to say postponed, adjourned, phased out, deferred. What we will soon analyze and describe as a certain Tristramian overpunctuation would thus be the precise counterpart of and symmetrical to Wagnerian hyperpunctuation. So uh, uh, Stern's or, or Tristram Shandy's overpunctuation is in a way the mirror reflection of Wagner, uh, Wagner's hyperpunctuation. Uh, it is the same. Uh, hyperpunctuation, but inflected in Nietzsche's eyes by a positive sign this time. But uh, before watching closely the work of punctuation in Tristram Shandy, uh, where we will witness the staging not only of the expansion of punctuation on an unheard of scale, but also of its paradoxical power the exercise of which seems to include its own deposition or dethronement. So before reading some decisive pages of Lawrence Stern's monument to punctuation, uh, I would like to take with you a quick glance at what we might call the prehistory of punctuation. Um, the Belgian Egyptologist Jean Vinan has described the practice of punctuation well before the time of Aristophanes of Byzantium and his disciple Dionysius Trax, uh, who are traditionally credited with the invention of punctuation in the second century before Christ. So what are these archi punctuations whose traces are almost lost in the mists of time? And what might they tell us, these ancient punctuating gestures of which we are no doubt the distant heirs, uh, without knowing it? Let's try to learn quickly, too quickly, just enough about them to support a statement, which is apparently a simple statement, but whose consequences are really unfathomable, I would say. Uh, the simple statement or hypothesis would be the following. Punctuation punctuates after the fact. So it's very simple, but I would argue that the consequences of this statement are endless. Um, so let's go back in time. First, 
because it begins like a mythological narrative, but believe me, my narrative is based on um, you know, serious sources like Jean Vinant. First, there was the rubrica, uh, that is the use of red, red ink. Rubricus uh, means red in Latin. Uh, the use of red to distinguish and highlight certain words or signs in relation to others, uh, these others being written in black ink. Used by the scribes to divide, articulate, and arrange their writings, the practice of the rubrica seems to bring together the functions of what we could call today a punctuation of the work, so to bring out the narrative structure, and of the page, the paragraphs, uh, and even of the sentence. So rubrica was used for all these uh, functions. Later, uh, the, the Egyptian scribes used points in the strict sense, as we know them, dots, uh, that is punctiform points, that are regularly evidenced in Egypt beginning in the New Empire from the 18th dynasty onward, and which generally uh, were also written in red, since they played a role analogous to that of the rubrica. It seems, however, that in the texts that have come down to us, these points or these dots uh, these periods, uh, though they don't always have the function of uh, period that we know of, uh, these points were never traced as the scribe wrote the text. Um, punctuation by means of points or dots, as Jean Vinant explains, was always done later. And this is very important. Later, that is to say, once the text was totally written. And even sometimes much later, as in the case of certain literary manuscripts of the Middle Empire that were punctuated, sometimes apparently, says Jean Vinant, by new empire scribes. Uh, so the point, therefore, uh, this is the lesson that we should bear in mind, the point uh, punctuates retroactively. Uh, it inscribes basically the rhythm of a re-reading or of a reappropriation. Closer to us, uh, there are other fascinating sequences in the history of punctuation, sequences that testify to um, what I would like to call punctuation's post-synchronization uh, work, uh, if I dare to put it this way. Thus, after scriptio continua, was adopted, scriptio continua, that is uh, writing without separation between the words, uh, and I'm reading what you see here. After scriptio continua without separation between the words was adopted in Greece and then in Rome, it was up to the grammatici to teach praelectio, a kind of pre-reading that consisted in annotating the text in order to make it readable. Signs of connection or separation, um, called hyphen and diastole, were introduced, oblique marks that allowed one to identify certain long vowels, as well as indications called posituri of the length of the poses to be marked. Uh, these devices meant to help phrase the text, were adaptable, however, and each reader used them differently, as Malcolm Parks emphasizes in his Pose and Effect, a study that no doubt remains the best overview of the history of punctuation in the West. Parks also relates that beginning in the 4th century AD, aristocrats, uh, amateur scholars, as, as he calls them, began in a way to sign their punctuations, claiming paternity over them with inscriptions in the manuscript books in their possessions. Thus, a certain 
Tursius Rufius Apronianus Asterius, born into old Roman nobility and endowed with various honorific offices, insisted upon writing in his copy of a text by Virgil that he had read and punctuated it, uh, Legi et Distinci Codicem, when he was consul in uh, 494. Later, someone called Aurelius Memus Simacus, who belonged to one of the most influential families of senators in Rome, the Simaci, likewise indicated that he had emended and punctuated, emendabam vel distinguebam, a copy of Macrobius's commentary on the dream of Scipio. So stamping or marking with one's imprint the points with which one punctuates, in a way countersigning the stigmatic marks and distinctiones with which one spaces the text, um, what we are witnessing here is a certain logic of over-punctuation. What I mean is that these amateur scholars, they punctuated these texts, otherwise the texts remained unreadable. Uh, but then, in a way, they punctuated their punctuation by signing it, uh, by, uh, indicated by indicating by their initials, uh, here I am, I punctuated uh, this text, and so I'm punctuating my punctuation, in a way. That's what I call over-punctuation. And of this over-punctuation, uh, we will uh, soon encounter other effects. So basically, this uh, short uh, panoramic uh, traveling uh, through the history of punctuation uh, gives us two uh, important uh, uh, aspects to, to think about. Uh, first of all, the retroactive uh, nature of punctuation. Punctuating always happens, not always, but uh, yes, always, but very conspicuously so. Uh, in uh, ancient Egypt happens after the fact. And uh, secondly, uh, punctuation always seems to go hand in hand with a form of over-punctuation, right, of repeated punctuation. Um, what we see at work in these ancient initialized punctuations of the Simacius and other uh, amateur scholars is in a way a point that doubles and divides itself in order to point at itself. That's what the initialing or signature does. You know, I punctuated this text, so I'm pointing at my punctuation of this text. Uh, in order to uh, make, uh, yes, to, to, to make itself noticed in a way. Punctuation makes itself noticed through this over-punctuation. In a word or two, uh, punctuation punctuates, punctuates itself. And uh, that's what we will see at work in Tristram Shandy in a, an absolutely virtuoso uh, way. Um, so if rubrication happens, uh, as Freud would say, nachträglich, or after the fact, and if the act of punctuating seems always prone to double and divide itself by remarking itself, where does that leave us as far as the subject of punctuation is concerned? So I would like to lend an attentive ear for a moment to this expression, the subject of punctuation. Uh, you can hear in it both a genitivus objectivus, punctuation as a theme or topic for scholarly study, the subject of punctuation in the sense of uh, the subject that we are speaking about. We are speaking of punctuation as an object. That's what you know, grammarian would call uh, genitivus objectivus. And also a genitivus subjectivus, Punctuation as that which gives birth to, generates a subject, i.e. subjectivity as an effect of punctuation. Right? So the subject of punctuation in the sense of uh, the subject uh, 
created or generated uh, by punctuation. And that's another way of hearing this expression, the subject of punctuation. So this expression with its double genitive um, could guide us in an auscultation of a few carefully chosen passages in what I am really tempted to call uh, the greatest stigmatological symphony or monument of all times, it's a bit emphatic, uh, Tristram Shandy, the novel by Lorenz, as Nietzsche calls him, Stern, Lawrence Stern. What we witness in Tristram Shandy is the autobiographical subject trying to anchor himself in himself by punctuating his writing of himself. Uh, let me just note uh, as a parenthesis that autobiographical subject could be quite a tautology, actually, if we think that subjectivity is coextensive with the very possibility of giving an account of oneself. So the necessity, even the urgency of uh, Tristram Shandy's attempt, as well as its ultimate failure, as we will see, are both inscribed in the same formula that reads as follows. So above you have the original edition of uh, Tristram Shandy, uh, 1761, and underneath you have a more readable transcription of the passages that I will quote. So uh, the formula of the, for the necessity of trying to punctuate in order to anchor the autobiographical subject in himself through its own account uh, of himself and of uh, the failure of this uh, attempt is the following. Uh, Lawrence Stern writes, or Tristram Shandy, the character, writes, uh, I quote, write as I will, it's a beautiful English, by the way, write as I will and rush as I may into the middle of things, as Horace advises, advises I shall never overtake myself, I shall never overtake myself, whipped and driven to the last pinch, at the worst, I shall have one day the start of my pen, so I will be one day in advance of my writing, and one day is enough for two volumes, and two volumes will be enough for one year." End of quote. So what you see here is that the, this distance between life and the writing of life, autobiography, this gap is impossible to fill otherwise than by death. And this is almost explicitly stated uh, in Tristram Shandy. Only death could make a strictly autobiographic writing possible by making the subject sort of adhere to, uh, to himself. Uh, and hence, at the same time, autobiography would become impossible. Right? Uh, there are some very interesting pages by Louis Marin uh, on, uh, on um, what he calls the two impossible cogitos uh, of autobiography, uh, i.e. I was born on the one hand and I died on the other hand. <laughs> um, so between the running flux or flow of the signifier on the one hand and the racing of life on the other hand, there is a constant sliding, uh, perpetual uncoupling, that nothing, no point de capiton, we could say with Lacan, no button tie, can halt or anchor in order to allow the narrator here to coincide with himself as a subject worthy of the name. I am tempted to put forward the hypothesis that this is the reason why Stern uses punctuation in a unique way in the history of literature. As many commentators have noted, Stern lets punctuation marks of all sorts proliferate. There are, of course, commas and periods and the like, but also dashes, very famously, of variable length, 
like the one that punctuates, uh, the ones that punctuate Tristram's quasi-castration by a sash window. It's a very uh, comical scene and dramatic too. Uh, there are straight lines that cross the page. Uh, there are untimely chapter breaks, uh, white pages and black pages. In a word, Stern lets punctuation marks luxuriate, as Nietzsche would say, as if his greatest concern were the halting, the interruption of the flux in an infinite quest for anything that could tie up the text to its subject or vice versa. Unfortunately, I don't have time to track or trace all these punctuating gestures in Tristram Shandy, but I'd like to focus, um, in order to conclude this uh, lecture, on two punctuating gestures that are particularly remarkable. Firstly, there is the very famous marbled page, or double page, that um, not unlike chapter breaks, uh, pertains to the punctuation of the work rather than the page or the sentence. Uh, it is preceded by this address to the reader, I quote, read, 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 my unlearned reader, read, for without much reading, you will no more be able to penetrate the moral of the next marbled page, motley emblem of my work, than the world, with all its sagacity, has been able to unravel the many opinions, transactions, and truths which still lie mystically hid under the dark veil of the black one." End of quote. So, if the marbled page can thus be the emblem of Tristram's work, open as it is to infinite possibilities of reading. I mean, you can read into it everything you want, basically, in this marble page. Um, it is because, as Tristram himself suggests here, it is because it takes its emblematic value from a previous double page that is named here and that I will soon show you, a previous double page and a black one this time, that mysteriously hides under its veil of ink so many things yet to be deciphered. Um, as we know, marble is the paradigmatic matter of monuments, but the most monumental of all the punctuations that are to be found in Tristram Shandy, the monument that seems to make all the other monuments hold and the punctuation mark that seems to lend its force or effect to all the other punctuation marks is the double black page, this double black page that punctuates uh, Parson Yorick's, one of the characters of the novel, Parson Yorick's death at the end of chapter 12, book one. This page, a funeral monument is a full stop blown up and, and magnified in its blackness until it fills or maybe overflows, as we will see, the dimensions of the page that contains it. A full stop that becomes a tombstone inscribing and commemorating here not only the mourning of the dead character in the novel, Parson Yorick, but also maybe the mortuary nature of any punctuation, its value as a stop or a full stop. A few lines before this monumental black full stop, as if announcing it, we come across the very first occurrence of the word monument in the novel. I quote, Ten times a day has Yorick's ghost the consolation to hear his monumental inscription read over. So, monumental, Tristram says. Now, this same word, monument or monumental, has only one other occurrence in the nine books that compose Tristram Shandy. And this second occurrence, no less striking than the first, 
uh, happens in the context of a speech, very fascinating speech, given by Tristram's father on in the occasion of the death, again, of one of his sons, Tristram's brother, then. The old Shandy, Father Shandy, speaks about punctuation and monumentality, about these monuments that punctuate death, the full stop of life, while being themselves deprived of their tip or of their point, i.e. being themselves interrupted. So these monuments, as you will see, um, <clears throat> he says, interrupt life, but they are themselves interrupted. Uh, we could say, in a way, that they are inter-interrupted, or again, punctuated in their very punctuation. And this will lead us back to what I suggested we could call over-punctuation. Here is the quotation, Christian Shandy's father uh, delivering this uh, uh, morning speech um, uh, after the death of his son. So he says, to die is the great debt and tribute due unto nature. Tombs and monuments, second occurrence of the word, tombs and monuments which should perpetuate our memories, pay it themselves, pay this tribute themselves to nature, and the proudest pyramid of them all, which wealth and science have erected as a monument, has lost its apex and stands obtruncated in the traveler's horizon. So pyramids as the biggest monuments of all to death, uh, they pay their tribute to death or ruin too by losing their tip, their, their point. So Tristram's father speaks here about the erection of a kind of monument of monuments, the proudest pyramid of them all, the ultimate pyramid, monument par excellence, as if he were thinking of the greatest full stop that has ever existed, a punctuation so monumental that in order to represent it in a book, one should fill a whole page with its blackness. Now, as we just saw, this monument to monumentality itself, this greatest pyramid of them all, is decapitated in uh, uh, Father Shandy's speech. It is, uh, so it loses its top or tip. It is topped, we could say, using this fascinating English verb uh, that uh, not unlike the French verb épointé, which translates it in, in, uh, in the French translation, uh, is uh, its own opposite. I don't know if you ever noticed that uh, to top, as the Oxford English Dictionary says, uh, means to deprive of the top. And it also means to put a top on or to form a top to. Right? So to top means its own opposite, exactly like the French uh, verb épointé. It means both. So it is as if this ultimate full stop the greatest pyramid of them all, topped and tipped, could only be the final full stop that it is by detaching itself from itself in order to punctuate itself, in order to be its own monument, i.e. its own ruin also. Now, coming back to Yorick's monumental inscription, then, to this uh, black... Uh, page and black tombstone, uh, we should say more rigorously that in Tristram Shandy, the greatest final full stop, the punctuation of punctuations, is the double black page that it is. Um, the status of which, right, the status of this double black page is affected by an irreducible duplicity. So it appears as a double black page in Tristram Shandy, but it is affected by this uh, undecidability. This punctuation mark, this full stop, is it so immense, so monumental, <clears throat> that a single page is not enough 
to contain it? Or is it doubled in order to punctuate itself? I think that this alternative remains structurally undecidable. Now, let me add just a few more words uh, by way of a conclusion. In order to punctuate properly, I hope I can, the hypotheses that I tried to present and share with you uh, this evening. I don't really know what my last punctuation mark should look like. Full stop, ellipsis, interrogation mark, exclamation mark, or Tristramian dash. And I don't really know either how many of them I should use. Who knows where punctuation marks can lead us? Hegel, in his Elements of the Philosophy of Right, described the monarch, the sovereign, as a punctuating effect. I quote, all that is required in a monarch is someone to say yes and to dot the I, to put a point on the letter. At the tip or top of the state, Spitze, says Hegel in German, um, the monarch is the added punctum or mark, the locus where decisive punctuations are confirmed or over-punctuated by a formal and empty I will. But think also of these fascinating lines in Leon Trotsky's account of the events of 1905 in Russia. I quote, the typesetters at Sitin's print works in Moscow struck, went on strike, on September 19. They demanded <clears throat> a shorter working day and a higher piecework rate per thousand letters set, not excluding punctuation marks. This small event set off nothing more nor less than the all Russian political strike, the strike which started over punctuation marks and ended by felling absolutism." End of quote. So the effects of a punctuation mark are incalculable, and this incalculability or undecidability to which Tristram Shandy's hyperpunctuation bears witness is a constant call for decision, for responsibility, precisely because every punctuation mark is divisible and therefore awaiting its overpunctuation, its topping in both senses of the word. Thank you very much. <clears throat>